YouTube, what is good? Today we are getting in the laptop, we are sitting down in Lightroom and we are talking about how to get clean edits. What are you doing wrong? Why are your edits not clean? What are some big mistakes you need to avoid? Now technically this video is probably more for beginners, but realistically there's probably some mistakes on this list that you might be getting a little sloppy with, even if you're the most experienced editor. I know me, I have to check myself every now and again and say, yo, you're getting sloppy with these edits, clean it up. Now everything in this video is mistakes that I made for years mistakes that I go back and look at my old work and say dude what were you thinking why did you do that now if you've watched the channel for a long time you know I'm someone who doesn't speak indefinite I never say there's only one way to do something I always believe there's a lot of different ways to get from point A to point B so when it comes to something like photo editing and making a video like this I don't want to speak in definite terms and I took a lot of time today to show how these mistakes can be mistakes in one scenario and not as big of mistakes in other scenarios and how it's on you as an artist to identify when you're making a mistake with a technique. I know that's confusing and I know nuance is confusing and it's hard to explain, but realistically when it comes to photo editing, there are no rules, but there are times where you could be doing something with your photo that makes it look extremely amateurish and you want to avoid those things. So that is what we're going to be talking about today. Do me a solid. If you enjoy this video, just hit that thumbs up button for me. If it happens to be your first video, hit that subscribe button. And hey, if you want to be a real MVP on the channel, you can head over to the Patreon it is linked in the description above this video. You can support the channel there. I think we're at around 73 Patreon members right now. If we can get to 100, that would be incredible. Thank you to everyone who has supported that already. Let's stop wasting time. Let's jump into Lightroom. Let's go over this. Huge mistakes that you want to avoid that are making your photos not clean and look kind of amateurish. Now the first thing we gotta talk about is actually cleaning up your image. Believe it or not, the best way to get a cleaner image has nothing really to do with the actual edit on the photo. It has to do with removing distractions and removing pieces of the image that don't need to be there. And this is one of the best examples I have of this. This photo looks solid. Colors on point, composition on point, everything is on point. But because there's so many reflective elements in the photo, there's a lot of these random light reflections all throughout the image that are taking your eye away from the scene itself. These things are very easy to remove, but it is tedious and it's very time consuming. So what I will do is I'll go into the photo, I will grab our clone or heel stamp tool. If I'm in Photoshop, I'll use the clone stamp and I just slowly start going over all these distracting elements to this particular image. This type of stuff right here, all this stuff. Now this is not fun, I don't like doing it, it takes absolutely forever, but the results give you such a cleaner image. Now, I'm not gonna do every piece of it right here. This is the final result. Look at that. Look how much better this photo looks. Look at how much less distraction there is. Let's bring all that back in check that out. That is a huge difference. It has nothing to do with your actual skill and it has more to do with your determination and how much effort you're willing to put into the image. So if you want a clean photo, cleaning up any visual distractions and anything that's taking your eye away from the scene is step number one. It's the easiest thing that you can do. So the next thing we got to be on the lookout for is clarity slider abuse. Now I don't know what it is about when people first get started with Lightroom, when you first get started with photography. I was for sure one of these people. We all want to take this slider and push it it all the way to the right and make it look like our photo is basically printed on sandpaper or being projected on a rock or something. I don't know why we do this, but overuse of the clarity slider is a big problem for beginners and it can lead to some negative artifacting in your image. One of the big things you'll see is the clarity halo right here. Notice that between the street and this blazer, you're getting this weird lightning effect and when you zoom out, you can see it even better. That is a result of too much clarity and you can see it really often in landscape photography where the sky meets a mountain. If there's too much clarity, there's gonna be this weird halo. Same thing on cityscapes where a building meets meets the skyline, you're gonna see this weird halo effect happening and you wanna avoid that and all you gotta do is be aware of it and when you see it, bring your clarity to a point that's a little more conservative, maybe plus 15. For this image, it's not really noticeable. Me, with street photography, I typically like to keep my clarity in the negatives just because I want a little bit more of a softer feel on things like street photography, but you don't necessarily have to. You just wanna be aware of some of the negative drawbacks of using that clarity slider and make sure 
you avoid them. Now, with each photo, it's going to be a different amount of clarity that the photo can handle. So with this image right here is one I made for the world of Coke here in Atlanta. And if you notice, our clarity slider is at plus 40, and we're not having any of the issues that we had on the last image. So from image to image, you might be able to get away with a little more clarity, with a little less clarity. You just never want to push it to the point where it's negatively impacting your photo. And you as the editor, you need to be aware of that and look out for it. Like this right here at plus 100, it looks terrible. It looks fake, but at plus 40, it's very punchy. It's really nice and it adds a nice effect to our photo. So like all good things, you don't want to overdo it and push it too far and give yourself too much of it. Now, the next mistake I want to talk about is something that I call color gaps. Now, that's a name I completely made up, but this is a mistake that I made countless times when I first got started editing colors in my photos. Now, this right here is a color gap basically a gap in the colors that looks very unnatural because you made an adjustment. Now, granted, I know what you're thinking. You're like, why would I just go down and all of a sudden bring my yellow to zero? And that's a fair point. Typically, that's not how you get these color gaps. Typically, you're going to get them when you start using presets, either presets you made yourself or presets that you purchase online. So here's how it goes. You have a photo. You take your settings that you saved, the preset that you made. You apply them to your photo and think, yo, this is dope, this looks great. But what's happening here is these adjustments were designed for another photo and don't fit your image perfectly. And it's up to you to realize where the mistakes lie in these edits. And the big one here is these color gaps in our sky. As you can see, there's these weird kind of like holes in our sky right here where it just looks unnatural and very amateurish. So what you can do to fix this is after you apply your preset, scan through the photo and realize, all right, we got some weird color stuff going on up here. Go into your color sliders and make the appropriate adjustments. Now, you don't have to bring everything back to zero. You just need to balance everything out. So we're going to start by bringing the saturation up on all these colors and bringing the luminance back to normal. I think right around here. And I'm going to bring these blues back to their normal hue as well, just to try to get everything a little bit more natural feeling. And then from there, we do still have some gaps, but they're a little bit more in control. Now, for me personally, I actually prefer on sunsets and skyline photos like this, just to get rid of any color adjustments, because it's going to look much more natural. Notice how all of our color gaps go away. But if you're someone who does want to adjust these colors, you want to move them around, just be aware that making dramatic adjustments to individual color channels can result in these really weird gaps in your colors. Now, here's the thing. This doesn't always happen to every photo. Let's go back to one of our previous adjustments. You can get rid of the yellows in this photo and it actually helps the image a lot. It looks really cool and solid. And in this case, if you had a preset that brought these yellows down to zero, you'd be completely fine. So it varies from photo to photo. It's just on you to realize when mistakes are occurring when you're using a preset or when you're making an adjustment to an individual color channel. This is another example of a photo that actually looks pretty decent with a preset applied to it. Even though we've made some dramatic adjustments to these color sliders, everything looks natural and normal and there's no major gaps or anything weird. And me personally, I think I like the natural colors more, but this is just an example of how to change the color sliders without creating any huge imbalances or gaps in your color. Next thing we were talking about is overuse of fade in the tone curve. Now, this is something that can happen once again from two things. One, you're just getting a little too loosey-goosey over here in the tone curve and you create way too big of an S-curve resulting in too much fade. Or what I think is probably the more common reason this happens is people getting presets, either ones that they purchased or ones that they made from previous edits, applying it to their photo and saying, yo, this looks tight and not thinking about the way that the fade or that particular tone curve could be affecting the image. On this example right here, this fade is not doing anything good for us. It's taking away from the clean feel of this image. It's actually making it feel kind of dirty. Now, you don't have to completely get rid of this fade. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It can be a you know creative element for you, but I think it would be good to get rid of some of it and not over fade your image. So all you got to do is go over to your point curve right here, grab this last point, and try to create a more linear curve. Now, you might only 
only want to bring it down towards the middle of where it was and that will give you a slight fade or for me I'm going to bring it all the way down right to here and basically get rid of it and really bring up the punchiness of this image and really bring out the clean feel of it. Now once again this is completely up to you. You can decide how you want to use it, how you don't want to use it, but if you find yourself in a scenario where you're having a bunch of fade on your photo whether it's made by you or made by a preset you need to know when it's appropriate to use it and when it's not appropriate. Getting to a more linear curve uh, you're going to be in a much better spot and you're going to have a much more clean looking image. So for our next example photo, we're talking about portraits and how to properly sharpen them. Now this can go for pretty much any photo, but it's especially prevalent in portraits with a shallow depth of field. Now if we zoom into this photo right here, we obviously want this piece of the photo to be sharpened. Everyone wants a sharp, clean, good looking image, but we don't want to introduce noise to parts of the photo that don't need it. We don't need to sharpen this blurred out depth of field area back here. So. How do we avoid this? If we just make a standard detail adjustment, we bring our detail way up, we bring our sharpness way up, we are gonna add noise into these areas of our photo, which is completely unnecessary. So what I'm gonna do is hold down the Option key and create a sharpening mask. Now, as I bring this up, any area that turns black will no longer be sharpened. So we're not gonna add sharpening into the parts of the photo that don't need it. So now we're gonna bring it right around 75, that's usually where I end up. So only areas in white are now sharpened and they're only the important standout areas of the photo like our subject's face, the borders on the jacket, and then a little bit of the windows and mirrors behind them. We could even push this to about 80 and there we go. We are now sharpening the areas that need to be sharpened without adding noise into the areas that don't need additional noise. So there we go. That is everything we had to talk about today. That is everything I wanted to break down. I hope you found it helpful. I hope you can apply it to your own photography. Like I said at the beginning of the video, this is all new ones. It's not definite. A lot of the things in today's video can be mistakes in some scenarios and in other scenarios not be mistakes at all. It's all on you to identify when you're doing something that is negatively impacting your photo and making your photo look amateurish and just not that clean, crispy image that you want it to be. So if you want to see more of my work, you can on my Instagram and Twitter, at Evan Ramp. Remember, check out the Patreon if you want to be a real MVP on the channel. Y'all are the truth. Hit that thumbs up, subscribe. Thank you so much for watching today. I hope you found this video helpful and I hope, like I already said, you can apply it to your own edits and take your work to the next level.